I'm very pleased this afternoon to be joined on the Warning Podcast by somebody that I regard as an American hero, uh, the former FBI agent, Ali Soufan, uh, the chair and CEO of the Soufan Group, and he is generous enough to join us from Doha, Qatar, uh, where he has just landed and is a little bit jet lagged, but nevertheless, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, Ali, whatever time it is in Doha. Good evening, Steve. It's a great honor to be with you. Thank you very much. Um, there may be many people who don't know about your career, and I want to let you unfold it in your words. I imagine when the calendar turns to September, it brings you back to... 22 years ago, this month, the clock was ticking. Why don't you tell us where you were 22 years ago, what you were doing, and what you had spent your previous years obsessed about, focused on, and trying to stop? 22 years ago, September 11, uh, 2001. I was in uh, in Yemen, and uh, the reason I was in Yemen, um, I was leading the FBI team investigating the USS Cole. Uh, somebody like me, I never thought in a million years I will be an FBI agent, I guess only in America. Uh, I came from uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, which was really suffering, uh, you know, during the Civil War. And I went to school in the U.S. I um, graduated uh, undergrad from a, pen, uh, a school in Pennsylvania, Mansfield University. It's in rural Pennsylvania. And uh, then I went to graduate school in Villanova. And uh, by the time I finished my graduate work, uh, the FBI offered me a position as a special agent. Uh, at the time, you know, the only reason I applied, it was a bet with uh, some friends to see how long I will last in the process. I was interested in national <laughs> security. I was interested in the act of non-state actors uh, and their impact on uh, geopolitics. Uh, however, I was not thinking that I will be working in national security. I wanted to be an academic. And uh, when the FBI offered me the job uh, at the time, my uh, uh, favorite show was The X-Files. I don't, I don't know if... Uh, you know, your uh, listeners remember the X-Files. So I was like, hey, you know, why not? Um, I'll go and join the FBI and stay a couple of years. And then I go back to academia. And uh, the rest um, was history. Uh, you know, I uh, became an FBI agent. I was assigned to New York. And because of my interest in the Middle East and the uh, activities of non-state actors in the region, I wrote a paper, a memo, uh, about this person that we should be paying attention to. His name is Osama bin Laden, and I believe he will create a lot of damage um, uh, to our interests in the Middle East. Uh, that memo made it to the head of the National Security Division at the time, uh, John O'Neill, who became the me my mentor and uh, who I lost that day on 9-11. He was in the World Trade Center when uh, the attack happened. Um, and, um, you know, I started to work Al Qaeda and bin Laden. I was involved in the nine, uh, not only in the 9 11 investigations in the school, but also in the East Africa embassy bombings and a lot of the uh, plots that Al Qaeda uh, tried to conduct in the time period between the East Africa embassy bombing in between 9-11. Uh, we disrupted many plots around the world um, and were able to be uh, successful in arresting members of Al-Qaeda, um, recruiting individuals in the organization. We were able to have a lot of successes during that time period. We uh, stopped plots around the world, in Europe, in North Africa, in Pakistan, in uh, the Arabian Peninsula, 
we're able to uh, disrupt a plot in Jordan. Uh, it's called the Millennium Plot uh, that uh, Al Qaeda at the time and its allies were planning to blow up hotels and uh, attack uh, borders crossings with Israel and even uh, a plan to assassinate the Pope when he was doing baptism at the Jordan River. And I was proud to be the case agent in charge of uh, that investigation for the FBI. So we had a lot of successes. Um, and uh, that's what led me to Yemen when uh, the attack on the USS call happened. October 12 of 2000, I was um, uh, put in charge of that investigation. So as a case agent, uh, we were uh, with the team, um, you know, with my team, the FBI team, and uh, we were supported by the military and the State Department, and the intelligence community, and the Naval Criminal Investigative Services and CIS um, to investigate that attack. And at the time, um, we developed so many uh, leads after we identified who was behind the call attack. We identified so many leads that led us to Southeast Asia. Meetings in Southeast Asia that uh, members of Al-Qaeda who were involved in the call attack directly and indirectly uh, were involved in. People who were involved in the call itself uh, were uh, you know, at these meetings as well. So we were asking our intelligence community, our own government, our own agencies uh, about information if they know anything about these meetings. And we were always told, no, no, we have no idea what you guys are talking about. We developed our own leads. Um, we were able to get more phone numbers, more addresses. We asked our own government, do you know anything about any of these numbers, any of these individuals? No. Uh, on 9-11, um, I was giving um, a folder and that folder included everything that we've been asking for since I have to say November of 2000. Uh, On September uh, 11th. And the people that I was looking for, yeah, September 11th. And the people that I was looking for in Yemen and around the world, some entities in my own government knew that they were in the United States and they were told me some of them were on the planes that hit the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. So for me, 9-11 is a day of uh, um, uh, sorrow, anger. Uh, I don't believe 9-11 happened 20, 20, 22 years ago. I still believe, you know, it just happened yesterday. They, Emotions are very raw, raw still. Um, I remember these feelings and I remember, um, you know, how we needed to put emotions aside, put anger aside, because we needed to prove to the world that Al Qaeda and bin Laden did it, find the evidence that our government needed in order to convince leaders in the Muslim world, who many of them did not believe that Al-Qaeda was behind it, and uh, to, to uh, uh, have the international community also agree with the U.S. that bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, based in Afghanistan, were behind that. And that was my first job immediately um, after I was told uh, those people that I'm looking for um, um, you know, we're in the U.S. And, uh, and we're able to do that. We're able to uh, go back uh, to uh, the, uh, the people, you know, to many asked for individuals that we were interrogating before. And um, all these leads led us to Bin Laden's personal bodyguard, a guy by the name of Abu Jandal. And uh, we, uh, you know, I had a conversation with him, um, you know, uh, where he basically, uh, not knowing, identified the photos of seven of the hijackers as Qaeda members. At the time, I did not even know that these people were hijackers. Uh, we showed him photo books. The very first time, he looked at the photo book 
and the photo book includes so many pictures, Steve. I don't even remember the amount of pictures we had. We had people from the East Africa Embassy bombing from the USS Cole. But then we had people that the government, you know, the FBI headquarters in D.C. and the White House were sending us of individuals that were arrested. Many, I, I recall many of the photos of Steak, uh, you know, because they have turbans and they have beards. And they arrested them and figuring out that they are Taliban or Al-Qaeda or they are part of the second wave of attacks. I was showing him all these photos. Um, um, you know, at the beginning, he didn't identify anyone except bin Laden and a couple of main leaders. That there's no way he won't know who they were. But later on, the second time, he did the same thing. And um, then I asked him to do it for the third time. And um, and he was confused, like, well, you know, I'm cooperating with you. I identified the people that I know. Why are you asking me? And I said, well, you know, just for for friendship's sake, since he's claiming he was a friend at the time. And um, and uh, I think he, I, I still recall he get to page number six or number seven from the photo book and he was turning it. And that's the only page that I knew, the only one that I knew he knows that person from my investigation. So I went back and, you know, I said, so you're telling me you don't know this guy. And I told uh, a buddy of mine who was the NCIS agent um, um, assigned to the case. He was my partner at the time, Robert McFadden. I said, I, I told you so. Uh, this guy is full of it. And uh, Abu Jandal was upset, like, how dare I question his integrity? So I told him what he knows about that person, gave him details that nobody knows except a person who is really over there and then he said oh yeah yeah I, I know this guy yeah so i identified that person and then i told him i said look you don't know who i know in this book he said when I, you first saw me you were shocked you were surprised you never thought that i was an fbi agent you never thought i was an american intelligence officer i said so you don't know how many people i have in this book who are exactly like me but were undercover in al-qaeda and they can tell you a lot of things about the organization and about your relationship to them. You won't know who, I have no idea who, the, who they are in this book. You know, I, I, there's a lot of people I don't know, but I'm not going to tell you who they, you know, the people that I don't know. But in the same time, you don't know who we have in our custody and talking about you. So you better look at the book again and identify the people that you know. My God, he identified so many people, including seven of the hijackers and, and with their leader, Muhammad Atta. And uh, at the time, I did not even know these people. Um, I did not know they were on the plane. And that's when the president at the time spoke to the American people when he said that Al-Qaeda and Bin Laden were behind the attack and our information was taken around the world from, uh, you know, uh, the president of uh, Egypt at the time, Mubarak, to Musharraf in Pakistan, to the king of Saudi Arabia. And um, they were given the proof that it was bin Laden, it was Al-Qaeda network who were behind the attacks on 9-11. Before I ask you a question about the legacy of those attacks and the wars that followed. Talk, if you will, for a moment about your friend and your mentor, John O'Neill, who was a colorful character so far as yeah. FBI agents go. <laughs> John was a character bigger than life. Um, you know, and people in the Bureau, either they loved John or they hated John. I mean, there you know you don't you don't have people who yeah, who are in the middle of this. <laughs> There's no gray zone. Um, but John um, had only one thing important in his life, and it was the mission, and it was the FBI. Everything else was just a sideshow. Uh, he was amazing in the way he can see the threat, can understand it, and can know 
everything we need to do in order to be ahead of it. He saw a lot of these things coming. That's why he took a new agent under his wing. And here I am, uh, a new person in the FBI office in New York, um, hanging out and having dinner or, you know, having meetings and, you know, uh, briefing uh, the person in charge of national security. That's usually did not happen <laughs> in, in the FBI during uh, that time. Um, John um, supported us, supported us in all our missions, uh, gave us everything that we need. Uh, if you're dedicated to the mission, if you're dedicated to the job, John was your biggest fan. If you thought of the job and the mission of counterterrorism as a job, um, then he's going to give you a hard time. He used to tell me all the time, um, you know, terrorists don't work nine to five. Terrorists don't work seven days a week. Uh, sorry, five days a week. Um, you know, and, and every time, like, uh, I was, uh, you know, once going to an engagement party, and he wanted me to go with him for some uh, meeting. And I said, boss, I, I have this engagement party, and I need to be there. And he thought I was getting engaged. He said, are you getting engaged? <laughs> I said, no, boss, I'm, I'm not <laughs> uh, far from it. He said, oh, because if you are, you have to come and talk to me about it. <laughs> I said, why? He said, do you know why divorce is so expensive? So uh, do, you, do you know if, uh, what's, sorry with my jet lag. He said, um, do you know why divorce is so expensive? I said, why? He said, because it's worth it. And that was John, you know, it's just like, you have to be only married to the FBI, only married to the mission, only married and everything aside. But, you know, last time I saw him, it was his last day in the FBI. He was um, retiring from the bureau and um, I was heading back to Yemen and uh, just a few days before 9-11. And we went to get a sandwich uh, from you know, a, a restaurant across the street from 26 Federal Plaza, the FBI offices in New York. And uh, and he was asking me about my girlfriend at the time, my now my wife. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm thinking about getting engaged. And he said, you know what? That's a great, that's a great. She's a really uh, good woman. She's been, you know, handling your shit all this time, all these years. Uh, and he gave me a big hug, and uh, and I was like, "What what happened here?" You know, I, I thought I thought he's gonna you know give me hard time, mm -hmm. and uh, that's it. That was the last time I saw him. Um, he went to be the head of security at the World Trade Center, and a few days later, he uh, died in the attack uh, by Al Qaeda in the attack by the people that he was trying to stop. And he was uh, uh, an amazing supporter for us during the USS call. And he pushed so much to get information that we were told, him and I and all the people who are working on the case, that this information did not exist. And this information uh, led to his death because it existed, but somebody refused to share it. Now, the person who ran the CIA's bin Laden unit, Alex Station, was somebody named Michael Schur. Talk about him. Mm -hmm. My interaction with him was uh, very limited, uh, frankly, but you know, I'm really disappointed with some of the stuff that I heard him saying in public. Um, you know, I, I saw a, uh, a congressional hearing where he. Uh, supposedly not supposedly he said it's uh, for their for people to google and see it um, the best thing that ever happened on 9 11 that the world trade center fell on john o'neill um, that is that's for me shocking and uh, that speaks volume about um, about the character of that individual um I didn't know much about him before. I knew people. Some people liked him. Some people hated him. But uh, I think uh, that specific 
sentiment that he expressed in Congress shocked all the people on the committee when he said that uh, speaks volume. And and he, of course, was the head of the per, the unit that denied you so much of the information that you needed to crack the case and to stop the attacks. I wanted to ask you, when you look back, how how close do you think you were to to stopping or being able to stop the attacks if you had the information that you had been told repeatedly didn't exist that CIA didn't have? That's that's something that I, I, I honestly I don't think there is a day that passes by that I don't think about this. It doesn't cross my mind for a split of a second. Um, so you want to tell me, I'm looking for people who I believe they were involved in the murder of 17 American sailors in Aden. And people who are connected to them, people that I'm looking for and the FBI is looking for in Southeast Asia, in Yemen, in the Middle East, are here in the United States, San Diego or New Jersey or Virginia, or whatever they were at the time. You want to tell me we won't be on those people like white on rice? You want to tell me that we won't be monitoring them and trying to figure out what they are doing or even arrested them and trying to, uh, you know, debrief them on uh, or interrogate them regarding the meeting in Southeast Asia that they were involved in regarding some of the leaders of Al-Qaeda that they were meeting and what they were planning. Um, um, I mean, there is no way um, uh, that that we won't be on them. Uh, we won't try and, you know, we know, we know how we do work in the FBI, um, you know, mapping the whole threat and arresting these individuals. And uh, at least they could have stopped uh, and run away. At least 9-11 probably could have been delayed or could have been stopped. And this is not only me who's saying that. I mean, if you look at the 9-11 Commission report, they talk about, um, you know, opportunities uh, that the plot could have been stopped or delayed. And one of them is sharing the information with the USS call team, you know, the FBI team investigating the USS call. That's one of the findings. Um, you know, at the beginning, there was so many, um, you know, deception about if informations were shared or not shared. I think the 9-11 Commission put that to rest. And also at the same time, now we have many of the reports, government reports have been declassified to include the CIA's own report that said that this information was not passed to the FBI on a timely basis, to so the FBI team investigating the USS call on a timely basis. And it held uh, four entities in the agencies and individuals in the agencies to include the director accountable for not passing that information. Um, however, um, like everything else since then, um, I did not see any real accountability uh, for, um, you know, um, holding people responsible for uh, not doing their job. And I think this lack of accountability goes hand in hand with lack of transparency. Um, and that's what creates a lot of distrust eventually uh, in the American public. Uh, you know, remember when we all believe that there is a mushroom cloud and there is you know, WMD in Iraq, and we all believe that, uh, you know, um, your torture worked, and we all believed, you know, whatever the government told us to believe. And then later we realize that it's all wrong. And then we, the American public realizes that there is no transparency, and then uh, they have been lied to. And, and unfortunately, that uh, contribute to the lack of trust that we have today between large uh, portions of our population towards the institutions and towards the government. When, when you think about that collapse of trust in institutions and the FBI, 
good news, bad news situation in 2024. Good news on the Republican debate stage. There's a Southeast Asian American, Vivek Ramaswamy. The bad news is he's talking about, well, we really don't know how many federal agents, FBI agents, CIA agents were on the planes that hit the towers on 9-11. And so you see wackadoodle conspiracy theories mainstreamed around this event in this in this country. You have presidential candidates that are considered serious from the Republican Party um, talking about abolishing the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, the institution has become profoundly politicized over the Trump era. Uh, how does that make you how does that make you feel? Do you understand it? The basis of it? No. Do you, do you, no, I, I, I how actually, do you think about the, the collapse of trust in the institution? Does it does it drive you does it drive you crazy? Does it does it does it make you want to cry? How does it how do you feel about that? It it frustrates me. Look, I'm I'm a person who left the FBI after I felt I, you know, I, I stayed after 9/11. I found out who was involved in 9/11. We, I, I I I led the team for about, you know, a few years after 9/11 until 2005, and then I realized that you can either, uh, you know, lead or be led or get the hell out of the way. And uh, at the time. I decided to get the hell out of the way, you know. I mean, I was here. I am fighting uh, to for the truth of what happened on 9/11 because I was inside um, the enterprise, if you want to call it, and I know exactly what happened, and I know how the information were not passed. And uh, at the time, when you're standing up and doing this, do you know how difficult it is? How many people will have the sharp knives for you? I used to say to people in headquarters and the FBI sometimes when they tell me, like, I've been traveling to Afghanistan or to Yemen or to whatever mission, say, be careful. I said, well, you know, I'm fine. You know, um, I'm not going to be in D.C. <laughs> I need to be careful in D.C., but not, not on the front lines. So I was, you know, it, it was difficult for me uh, to do that. And so having said that, I uh, look at the successes that we have in the U.S. government. And I look at the men and women, not only in the FBI, but also in the CIA, the people in the field, the people on the front lines, not the people, you know, sometimes uh, during that time period, the, um, the people around the George Tenet, but I'm talking about the CIA men and women in the field um, now um, and back then. I look at the military operatives, uh, the SEALs, the Delta, that they do amazing work in keeping American secure, the American public secure and uh, fight for the United States. And I see how much sacrifices these people do. I see how many sacrifices the men and women of the FBI do on a daily basis, uh, domestically and internationally. Uh, and it's very difficult for me to see individuals like you know, the people that you mentioned who have no idea about anything. They never read a report about 9-11. They don't know, uh, you know, the truth is really more complicated uh, than um, just brushing it with conspiracy theories and lies because it it, sells. it, 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 it gives the audience. Um, um, I think it makes it very difficult because if you want to abolish, let's say, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, you know, the Bureau, who fights counterterrorism? <laughs> Who fights spies? Who protect the nation against industrial espionage? Who protect the nation against um, foreign agents and uh, and 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 uh, you know uh, um, individuals who are trying to do us harms? Who fight uh, to protect our communities uh, regarding uh, you know pedophiles and crimes against children, uh, organized crime, uh, white collar investigations? Uh, so you just want to get rid of all this just because you had a crook, a crooked guy who uh, did not want to believe he lost an election. I mean, come on. Um, and it's sad to see it coming from a party that always claimed to be the national security party, the party who fights for national security. Um, you know, I, I'm 
I'm disappointed to to see all these things and to hear about all this stuff, and uh, it makes me it makes me sad. And uh, because I know a lot of these people and I know how much they sacrifice uh, for the sake of the nation, um, but unfortunately, we live in a time period where um, we have a lot of crooks and um, they talk about uh, the world. Uh, they give an opinion about the world and about the United States that actually, frankly, reflects um, reflects their own character. It's a confession of their own character. That's why they say these things. Uh, these people, I don't believe they believe in the fidelity or they believe in the bravery or the integrity that the men and women of the CIA or the FBI or the military live by. And unfortunately, uh, you know, it's, uh, we have something called the first, you know, fortunately we have something, we have the first amendment. Unfortunately, we have people like them taking advantage of it in order to create more division and in order to create hatred against against the institution that keeps us safe. Look, you know, don't get me wrong. I stood up when we had problem, when the institutions were lying to the American public, some of the institution. I stood up and uh, I fought. And, and uh, towards the end, the truth came out. That's exactly what's great about America. You know, if I was in China, fighting the Chinese intelligence agency because they were lying to their people or in Russia uh, or in North Korea or in Iran or in Saudi Arabia, I will be subjected to a bone saw or to a bullet or suddenly I'll fly through a window. That's what happens. But in America, you stand up, you do it right. You fight smart, you fight hard and the truth will come out. Look, we're not perfect. The founding fathers never claimed that they created a perfect system, but we always strive towards a more perfect system. And that's with our politics, that's with our institutions, that's with our um, everything. And that's where we are. And I'm sure now we, we are on a low a little bit. <laughs> you know, the, 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 uh, the city in, a, in the hill lost a lot of its shine. But I'm confident with the system that we have, with the people that we have, that the truth eventually will come out. Look at, you know, what we were talking about, 9-11 and torture and all these things and the war in Iraq, all the stuff that I stood up against. I got a lot of supporters in the FBI, in the CIA, in the military, in Congress. Some of them were supporting me, behind, most of them actually were supporting me behind closed doors. Not a lot of people want to, you know. Um, uh, you know, one of my biggest supporters who helped me, uh, um, you know, go through all these things and just made me know that somebody is watching my back is Senator McCain. And um, and guess what? You know, eventually the truth came out. Eventually, these documents were declassified. Uh, when I wrote a book about what happened on 9-11 and what happened with torture and how the American public were lied to. The book was heavily declassified, heavily redacted. The, the FBI told me there is no secret in this book. Go ahead and publish. Another agency said, absolutely not. And they redacted the hell of that book. But you know what's great about America? As frustrating as it was for me to have big sections of my book redacted, the sections that make my point about, you know, uh, what I want to say to the American public, all of it were redacted. Um, the awesome thing that nine years later, those same people said, okay, you can publish, we were wrong. We went through the legal process, federal judge looked at the case, and they said, you know what? No, you have no right to tell him not to write these things because these things are not national security. You're redacting them for different reasons. That's what America is all about. So as much as the system frustrates the hell out of me, as much as the system made me through, live through hell, but also the system worked 
because we use the same system to fight back for truth and for doing the right thing. And we were successful. I didn't have packs behind me. I didn't have, you know, uh, money. I didn't have lobbyists. I didn't have any of these things. I just had the truth. And guess what? We won. And that, that's what's great about America. And that's why I believe that with all the things that we see, with all the pessimism, with all the partisanship, I believe towards the end, truth will come out. And, uh, and, uh, and, and for those people who say all these bad things about the Bureau, and I'm not you know, trying to defend the Bureau, the Bureau will defend itself and they defend themselves, even though they are very bad at it because <laughs> they don't talk publicly most of the time. Um, Let's go one by one, 9-11, okay? Every single investigation to include the CIA, they said that if the information was passed to the FBI, 9-11 could have been stopped, number one. Number two, the Iraq war. The only agency, the only agency in the US government that refused to say Iraq has WMD and connected to all these things that the administration was trying to sell to the American public was the FBI. The only people who investigated a lot of the stuff that has to do with uh, the banking crisis or, or all these things, the only people who did not, um, you know, allow their people to be involved in torture were the FBI. And Trump himself was so happy when the FBI reopened the case on Hillary Clinton before the election. And now he is so pissed off at, at them because they were investigating investigating him for, look, you know what? We don't decide or the Bureau does not decide who the crook is. We just follow the crook. And uh, unfortunately, when you start seeing partisanship go to this level that we put party above country, we put party above our system, we put the party above our constitution, we put the party and the loyalty to the party against the men and women who are protecting this nation and putting their life on the line day after day against all enemies, domestic and foreign, I think um, I think it's sad and it's frustrating for somebody, you know, who experienced all these things that I experienced in my life. A few weeks back, I, I was really honored to have Ken Burns on the podcast and we were talking about a forthcoming documentary about the American bison talking about the civil war this moment in history and Ken Burns said something interesting that that's accurate he said the American revolution uh was a civil war uh, the civil war in this country was in fact a sectional war uh, but you grew up in a country and were eyewitness to a civil war before you became an American at this moment of cold civil war in this country, the division, the political incitements to violence. Um, I wanted to ask your perspective about it, but I also wanted to ask you in, in, in con connection with it, uh, you on at least two occasions um, have taken a constitutional oath. Um, you took the naturalization oath um, to become an American citizen. Um, and then, of course, you swore an oath of allegiance to the Constitution when you became an FBI agent. Can, can you talk about um, the experience of seeing a society unravel um, and then the meaning of those oaths the swearing of an allegiance not to a landmass, uh, not to a political party, but really to a concept or a bundle of ideas. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question, uh, Steve. I, you know, I I recall the civil war in Lebanon vividly. I lived through part of it, and. I recall my parents telling me that Lebanon used to be the Paris of the East or the Switzerland of the East, modern, wealthy. And then suddenly um, we had such a sectarian division, not political division, such a sectarian division that uh, people start looking at 
nationalism only through the lens of their own sect. And, and that led to a civil war. And unfortunately, I start to see uh, some folks in the US mimicking that. Now in, in Lebanon, we did not have um, a good political system. We did not have the ideas that you're talking about. You know, we did not have a country that went through a lot and evolved and have, uh, you know, an amazing constitution that's a living document. And I have a Bill of Rights and it has all these institutions to support and protect that, that concept. And that is the difference I would like to believe that we have in the United States. When I took the oath, um, first for citizenship and then for the FBI and later for many different things that I was, you know, doing and, you know, you have to take the oath for it. Um, it's, it meant a lot to me and it's not uh, just words that you say because um, you have to get a paycheck. For me, it's a way of life. And that's why I left the government in 2005. I continued to fight. I continued to fight to get the truth about 9-11 to the American public. I continued to fight against torture. I testified in 2009 to Congress um, way after I left the FBI uh, about torture. Um, and I continued to do what I do today in my company to protect uh, the national security of the United States and to fight terrorism. Um, as you know, we were uh, the first people who talked about foreign fighters in Syria when nobody wanted to talk about it. We were the first people who talked about the rise of domestic terrorism in the United States. We're focusing internationally and we're not looking at the monster that is growing inside our midst with the white supremacists and the neo-Nazi groups and those people, you know, that um, that's uh, fighting a war Hitler lost <laughs> Uh, 75 years, uh, 78 years ago, whatever. Um, and, 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 and it's amazing for me that, um, you know, uh, to, to look into this amazing nation that we have and the constitution that we have and the institutions that we have and the loyalty of people from all walks of life they come from, you know, Europe, you know, everybody came from somewhere here, except like if your your name is running bare or something, everybody come, came from somewhere. And you see them all um, having this loyalty, not to a bloodline, but to a concept. And few countries in the world that nationalism is based on a concept. Patriotism is based on a concept, not on a bloodline. And we have that in the U.S., and I don't think any country in the world has it better than us. Yeah, you said that so perfectly, and it's such a part of the strength of the country. And you talked about a Native American name, Running Bear. Um, you know, in the Second World War, in the, in the Pacific theater, um, if Running Bear was a Navajo, uh, he may well have found himself in the Marine Corps, uh, where he was a code talker. And yeah. one of things that happened in the Second World War is that the Allies very early on broke the codes of both the Germans and the Japanese uh, who were not able to break the Allied codes. And, and one of the reasons the Japanese never were able to is they had no grasp of context around connection to the language that was being spoken. Mm -hmm. And it was a Native American yeah. language. No one in Japan spoke Navajo, and you and you think about that and you apply that to Ali Sufan, uh, here you have a young man who comes to America from a war-torn country, uh, receives an education, goes to college, winds up in the FBI, um, and you walk into a room uh, somewhere around the world facing a terrorist, and you open your mouth, um, and you speak fluent Arabic, um, you can quote the Quran back and forth. Um, and the power that flows from that diversity, um, that combination of national strength that comes from being the only country in the history of the world to be made up of all of the peoples of the world, 
uh, where every language is spoken every day um, has been a profound benefit to the United States. And you represent that uh, perfectly. Thank you. And, and I had so many people who are native Arabic speakers and we used to do missions together. And we used to arrest these people and go and talk to them. And literally many of these terrorists, they look at us, they thought we're Israeli Mossad, Jordanian intelligence, every single country in the Middle East you can imagine. They never thought for a second we're Americans because in their mind, there is a look for the American FBI or CIA and we're not it. <laughs> um, so it, it was great. And we saw the same thing in Afghanistan. We had people in Afghanistan that speak Pashtuns or, or you know, or Uzbeks and, and, and they were, they were amazing. Uh, and that's, what's great about America. Um, you know, I mean, with all the problems that we have, um, we're still um, great. I mean, seriously, I, I mean, economically, um, we dominate the international economic system in the world. We created uh, the system that benefited so many countries and probably the most wealth the world it ever had uh, in its history. Um, even countries like China that we're competing with today, if it wasn't for the system, the economic system created by the United States, uh, there were no way they will have they have now. Um, and we are still, um, you know, uh, dominating on so many different levels. Uh, unfortunately, nobody can defeat us outside the United States. We can only defeat ourselves with our division. And uh, I think that's why you see many adversaries of the United States using social media, using AI, using a lot of these, you know, crooked politicians in order to promote conspiracy theories, promote division, um, you know, taken unfortunate incidents uh, and or tragic incidents like, you know, 9-11 or the Iraq war and put all these things in a different context in order to create instead of having accountability and having learned from our mistakes and not repeating it, create division and distrust because only when you create distrust in a system, in a republic, in a democracy like the United States, only when you create distrust between the people and the institution is when you win when you weaken the United States. And unfortunately, that's exactly what's happened. Um, that is perfectly stated. Abraham Lincoln talked about this. He said the greatest armies of Europe, if they invaded the United States, would never take a drink of water from the Ohio River. He was right then, he's right now. And he said that yeah. if we are to be undone, it will be by our own hand. It will be a form of national suicide. Um, and that's always been the case in the in that's, the United States. That's unfortunate, and um, you know, and, and 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 the world is getting more dangerous. Like for example, 9/11 happened 22 years ago. Al Qaeda on that on the evening of 9/11, they had 400 members. 19 of them were on the planes. Today, Al Qaeda itself have more than 40,000 members. And they are not only in Afghanistan, they are not only in Kandahar or in Kabul, they are also in Yemen with Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. They are in a Sahel, they are in West Africa, they are in uh, back in Afghanistan, <laughs> they are in so many different places, they are spread around the world. You know, we used to have embassies even in Kabul. We had an embassy in Libya. We have an embassy in Syria. We had an embassy in Yemen. We had an embassy in Somalia. We have many different Somalia. Now we don't have embassies in any of these places. We don't have embassies in all these places. You know, we're, we're running blind. Um, and so the world is very dangerous today. We have more areas in the world, important geopolitical areas in the world, that are controlled by non-state actors, not by, by states. And I'm not talking about the coups in Africa. I'm talking about uh, Yemen, for example, with the Houthis on Lebanon, with Hezbollah, or al hashd al-Shabi in Iraq, or Al-Qaeda, or the branches of ISIS control large swaths in lands of, of lands. Still, not only in Syria and in Iraq, this is a smaller, but in Africa, northern Nigeria, like Boko Haram. So we have an arc of instability that goes all the way from our western shores of Africa all the way to Southeast Asia. 
um, Taliban is back in control of Afghanistan. This is the world that we live in. Then we have this war in Ukraine with Russia that is in the, you know, uh, you know, they, 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 from a geopolitical perspective is uh, a second order, global second order, because the first order is still China and the competition against China. So if we need unity, it is now. We have so many, the world is literally on a crossroad. And then you have these people on the stage, on the Republican stage, saying the stuff that you were talking about. Um, and they want to demolish the institutions that making us strong and making us, uh, you know, able to protect the American public of all the enemies, domestic and 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 and, and uh, foreign. It's um, you know, I, I I'm still optimistic. I still believe that the glass is half full, and uh, and I think we need to do a better job in you know standing up for our values. And America will stand up for itself. We went through a lot before. And America always prevailed. And I believe we will prevail. Our system will prevail. And these crooks will find themselves in the trash bin of history. I think that is a perfect place to leave it on a note of optimism. Ali Soufan, it has been an honor to be with you. Uh, everybody, I encourage you to read um, the accounts of what Ali Soufan has done with his life. Uh, the chronicles of it, along with FBI agent, supervisory FBI agent John O'Neill in the Looming Tower, an extraordinary service, uh, an extraordinary story of service and dedication to the country. It's been a real pleasure to spend this hour with you. Thank you, Ali. The pleasure is mine. Thank you, Steve.